So you got to look at what you do. And I think in today's society, you know, and it's, it's always it's something we've done every generation. But with social media now, it's so easy to be like, oh, man, look at what they're doing. Because everything's edited, everything's trimmed, everything's highlighted. It's not real. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. I am your host and coach, Tyler Johnson. And whether you've tuned in to elevate your mindset, your game, or just your day, you are in the right place. My guest this episode is an entrepreneur, coach, and world champion martial artist who's overcome his own adversity and now helping others build resilience and achieve their success. He's passionate about inspiring and empowering others, which you'll hear all in this episode. Please welcome to the Elevate Podcast, Matthew Boyer. doing great yourself i'm doing well it's great to have you uh i wanted to start off um jump right in it is dig into the martial arts champion stuff uh we've okay. had a lot of guests uh, a lot of things represented but i don't know if we had a martial arts champion on here so tell us a little bit about that journey and then how that translates into to the work and what you're doing now so you know i always wanted to be in martial arts i was like every kid that grew up during, you know, I'm 42. I grew up when the karate kid was big. So I wanted to do it. Took me forever to get my mom and dad to put me into it. My dad had a lot of friends that would train, you know, in the early seventies and stuff, but they just, they just did it to go get into street fights. They did. He had, he had a very poor understanding of what the martial arts really was. And so at the age of 10, I got into martial arts and I've never looked back. I've always loved it. Um, I didn't always love competing. That's something I kind of picked up later on in life, just wanting to continue to train. And it, it was one of those things that I never realized what it, what the martial arts training and the lessons and everything I learned really did for me until I was an adult, until I was in business and had a lot of conversations with friends of mine that are in business and are still doing martial arts, but like me, been doing it their whole lives, that we were able to kind of look at that journey and, and kind of analyze like why did it as adults kind of like made our brains different or why do we look at things the way we do you know a good friend of mine who also coaches me brett thomason and i have has spent a lot of time talking on you know different different habits that we have different things in business and in life that we do and how how that probably came from the fact we've been martial arts our whole lives and how that how that kind of equates and that's when i started using those in, in my teaching at the school, you know, our, our motto at Boyer Academy is training the champions of today to be the leaders of tomorrow, because I noticed a trend in my, my staff. We've, I've had the school now 15 years. I have one student that's been with me all 15. I've got several have been with me, you know, uh, the other day we just, I think celebrated Emily's six years. Uh, Kendall's going on eight. Emma Riley's going on 11. They've, I've seen them grow up and I've seen what they've become now that they're getting high school, out of high school, into college, adult ages, what those lessons and what like what our atmosphere has kind of done. And that's that's kind of where that's evolved from. Yeah, I, uh, I had a limited martial arts experience as a kid. I, I got thrown into Taekwondo and the thing they told me is you need discipline. And yeah. I was already getting in fights in school. So I'm like, you're going <laughs> to pretend like you would. Now you're going to equip me with skills, kick it. Like, um, and, you, you know, it did help me. But I, I it, looking back, I don't know if it was discipline. I think that was what we got. The, the label got, got thrown. But it was instructor intention. The intention in, in I got from an instructor was so much different than a coach or a teacher I had. And that was, I think, the biggest difference that opened up all the lessons, um, at least for me. For You know, you kind of talked about at 10 years old, getting kind of hooked on it. Uh, was there a person, coach, mentor that kind of really helped pull you in or was it very intrinsic? You know, the whole thing pulled me in. The The whole atmosphere, the the kicking and punching, I just, I, you know... People say, okay, martial arts, individual sport, not a team sport, but we were a close knit school. It was a team. I had my friends there and I just was drawn to 
getting better. You know, I remember watching people in the front of the class that I idolized and how good and crisp they were and being like, man, I got to, I got to do that. And th these are things that I kind of went back and, and have thought about later on in life. But as I came up through it, I was close with all my instructors, but um, Vern Vineyard was, you know, when I was 14, the black belt that always came to class, all Vern, Vern was an elderly gentleman. There's like a grandfather to me was going on to, um, Matt was graduating high school and going into the Naval Academy in Annapolis. And so I was told, Hey, we need you to come to class a little more, help Vern out. And Vern became just this like huge life mentor. He taught me a lot about business, gave me my first personal development books, which was uh, the one minute manager and how to win friends and influence people. Maybe. And I held on to Dale Carnegie's book for years. I was so mad when I finally did read it because he gave it to me. When I was like 16. I was like, yeah, cool, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. You know, and I didn't, dive into it. And then when I was getting ready to start my martial arts school, when I turned 28, so I was probably around 26, I was kind of getting in that mindset. I started reading it and I was like, oh man, Vern, you nailed it. I should have, should dove into this, but he was, he was such a good role model for me. And he called me in the office, he breaks stuff down on the business, or if somebody did something dumb, he'd be like, see, and this is why we don't do that. It, it was so helpful. There's so many lessons. We actually have a, a big cardboard cutout or a poly cutout at the school called Big Vern. We, uh, a friend of mine did a character. We kind of modeled it after Vern and we use little lessons for Big Vern. Love it. That's a very cool idea. Let his uh, legacy live on a little. Yeah, it's a fun way. I wanted, I want to do more with it, with our youth programs and some like lesson pages and some different stuff, but I haven't really executed on it yet, but it, that's kind of where the plan is to use that, to keep him alive and to use those lessons he taught me. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great book you mentioned. I, I think I was given it a little, I think maybe in my college years, but read it on my way out of my college <laughs> years yeah. and kind of into that professional life. And yeah, again, had that same feeling. Um, but on that notion, um, reflecting back, uh, what's something else, you know, Besides reading Vern's book, if you look back to to being a teenager, something you would have maybe shaped or, or done a little bit differently. You know, um, I had somebody ask me this uh, in a post the other night, and I, it's easy to look back on life, especially you know I'm 42. I'm at that age where like a lot of us kind of start thinking of that stuff, and there's things that it's like, well, if I would have found a lot of the, if I would have found like a Tony Robbins back then, I had no clue who any of those people were. Yeah. I probably would have developed, I, I wouldn't have went into business any younger because I started my school at 28. That was pretty young. And I always had like a little side hustle. I painted cars, I mowed lawns, whatever. I always had that entrepreneurial spirit. I think I wouldn't have changed anything on my path because it's made me who I am today. And it's made me able to work with and help kids. And, and at the martial arts school, there's just so many lessons I've learned over the years. I really wouldn't want to change any of that, but I would love to have found, because I'm a personal development junkie these days, books, podcasts, you name it. I just, I eat it up and I enjoy it so much. I wish I would have found that at a younger age. I try to with my uh, my like my leadership team at the school this year for Christmas. They all got a card, they got a gift, and then they got a book based on their personality. Where I think they're at a book that I thought you know it was either Atomic Habits or Relentless or um, there's a few of them I gave them, and they actually do read them, which is great because I wish I would have found the Tony Robinsons and the uh, less less uh, I'll mess it up. I'm bad with names, less, but less. they're. Les Mills, or is that a workout guy? There's a Les Mills, but I think that's a body workout guy. I think that's a body workout. Yeah, I was say, there's so many Les. names. I follow so much content, but there, there's a bunch of them that I wish uh, I wish I would have found that realm. Like when YouTube was new, I wasn't a real big computer person. I was at the martial arts school or I was tinkering with a car. I, I'm doing something with my hands. I wish I would have found that content younger because there's when these these people that are so successful take time to give back and to teach those lessons it's just so much value in it for sure i think that's a lot of the people that listen to this coaches student athletes you know all competitors of different walks and i think whether you're a coach or an athlete finding those mentor people and sometimes they they maybe are those larger aspirational captivating people that you mentioned and you gave people a good little snippet of some books there go check those ones out he yeah. mentioned they're all yeah. good um but you know even in our in our own 
ecosystems. I think it's so important to, to help young people realize the, the value uh, of having other mentors in their life and other adults that can be trusting that maybe they're helping them on their, their journey through martial arts or sport or whatever it might be. Um, but what, when you think about having those relationships from both a, a, a teenager's kind of perspective, what, what should they kind of look for? And then, you know, from the other side, um, how can we build trust with those, those young people? I, you gave a great example of, you know, giving specific books to the people, your employees and people at your school that, you know, are not just giving everyone the same book. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Right. And, you know, there's a well, little, that was this, hard too. <laughs> <laughs> maybe there's a different book for that. Right. But uh, you know, but the, it, it is specific and intentional, but how, what are ways we can create trust so we can help young people find the bridges to those mentor relationships? Well, I would say the biggest thing, if you're a young person like, at any age, if you're looking for a mentor right now, our world is overwhelmed with people that are wanting to be mentors that haven't done it. I, I was recently at an event. There was someone talking about um, fitness and, and training and all this stuff. And you could tell they've never done a day in their lives. And they were lecturing someone else on what they needed to do. And I was really struggling to keep my lips shut because there's so many people out there, whether they're overweight and they want to teach people about health and nutrition, or they've never, you know, I'll have parents, um, and I giggle at this sometimes and I shouldn't, but I'll have like a new white belt come in and dad will be out front after class, like really working on coaching them. And it's like, Oh my goodness, please stop. Cause you can <laughs> tell they've only seen martial arts in the movies or they yeah. just watch a lot of the UFC mm -hmm. find someone that's done it. You know, um, when my team started wanting to compete at a little bit higher level, I realized I was rusty. I hadn't competed in several years. And so I reached out to my good friend, Brad, multi-time world champion. I said, Hey man, would you train me? I want to start competing again. And it, you know, the, my team was like, well, why you've, you've already done this before. I was like, well, a lot of things have changed and I want to give you guys the best knowledge I can. So the best way to do that is to step on the mats myself and run it and let's see. And that's what sparked me, you know, team USA and all the stuff I did with them was doing it from a point because I'm not going to tell them you better do this if I haven't done it or if I haven't you know, been in that realm. And I think there's so many people right now giving out advice that don't know it. So if you're a young person looking for a mentor, don't let anyone give you advice. That's not where you want to be. If they're trying to teach you how to be better at basketball, they better be better than you at basketball. And I find that, you know, I'll even compete at tournaments. I'll have people come up, Hey man, you know, that kick, you should do this. And I'm thinking you didn't even place in the division. I just got second. You're going to give me, ad okay, well, thank you. I'm polite. I thank you. But I walk off and we chuck. It's a, it's kind of an yeah. ongoing joke. We always chuckle because the ones that actually know their stuff, you'll walk over and say, excuse me, Sensei Kramer, question. Great man, legend. And he'll show you. But he doesn't come up and like interrupt you to tell you what to do because he actually knows. The, the people that don't know will do that. And building that trust is you know, where are they, what advice are they giving you? If they're a mentor, if there's someone trying to help you, and I, I do this this day with anyone that I work with, any coaches, what's in it for them? Just look at it that way. What's in it for them? Yeah. You know, are yeah. they saying, oh, wow, you'd be really good at this because there's money to be made on you? Or, you know, is there clout to be picked up by, you know, having you maybe in their content, you know, what's, yeah. what's in it for the person on the other side, if you're looking yeah. to figure out that trust, are they just, there's just some people that are good at what they do and want to help. And, you know, if they see you do it something, but they, maybe they see that same work ethic in you, then they're going to give you that extra help. So what's in it for them? Yeah. I don't think, uh, you kind of nail it the people that are kind of projecting advice and it's the same thing to everyone is you know i guess in the in more competitive uh worlds that that are kind of around it you know it just doesn't work because i think questioning and understanding where a person at is because i mean i don't know if you watch golf or my, my mom was a golfer but scotty scheffler's best golfer most people would be like hey don't move your feet he moves his feet all the time like it works for him, right? And it's like, if you ask me, hey, why do you do that? I I have control. I can do it that way. You know, he, it's, it, there's a reasoning. And I think especially, you know, there's a reason you do your kick the way you do it, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the way you train it and the way you execute. And so uh, 
the other side of that lesson is, you know, there's critics everywhere, right? And it's usually the ones that can't do the kick or can't do what you do. Um, they get really loud and amplified in the social media in today's kind of world that that we're in. Uh, what are ways that you help uh, your students and your academy uh, and people just tune out those distractions that can be so loud? I'm just, I'm just blunt about it. Like we'll be at tournaments and uh, where were we? We were in, we were in Cardiff, Wales, getting ready for Worlds, and there was a couple um, people that were there were kind of throwing some tips out. And uh, Brett and I had a little side discussion, and we went over and got our team. We're like, "Listen, you don't change, you don't do nothing unless it comes from my mouth, Brett's mouth, or Sensei Kramer's mouth. It doesn't go." And I'm just really blunt with my my. When I say my team, so I've got my students and I started a competition team a couple of years ago, and then I've got the ones that are, so any of my leadership staff that helps teach and stuff at the school are all black belts and they, they 89, 90% of them all compete at a very high level. It's not just for them. It's something right. anyone can be a part of, but the, the ones that have been with me for five or six years, like they know who, because they'll be like, Hey, this person, I'll just chuckle. And they're like, yeah, that's what I thought. I'm just very blunt with it. I, I couldn't come. I would watch coaches kind of sugarcoat it. Oh, that's interesting. What about this? I just told my guys like, well, that person's an idiot and it's terrible. It sounds negative, but it's just very blunt. And a lot of times the tournament, I ain't got time. Yeah, they don't have time. They're trying to get to a division. I'm trying to get to a division. I'll be like, they told you what? And they'll giggle. Cause normally when they're coming up to tell me it's because they already know it's just a, it's a hoot, but just being very honest. I feel like in this day and age, if you're, honest with someone it's oh that's oh you're being aggressive or you're you're not thinking about my feelings but man to be honest, over the years i found your real friends are the ones that are just dead honest with you yeah well i think that yeah like just like you said it might sound negative but blunt and honest but let, let's be truthful the what the distraction is is the information and now you're talking about that person's information and not yeah, you're creating more of a distraction. Right. Yeah, you're like, taking like your mind not, off. It's, 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 it's not even what the information is. It's just the, the now they're talking to you about, hey, what this person said. Yes. It's, it's, it doesn't matter what the next part is. It's already a distraction, right? We've already, yeah. we've already, we've already kind of entered that. And so, like you said, you as a coach, you got to nip it in the butt, change it, re redirect it really quick. Um, yeah. And so that's what I think also that young athletes need help with. They don't show up with that skill, right? They show up in a world yes. of bombardment, things coming at them from places that they don't even understand or want to sometimes. And we have to help them throw them out there into challenging environments and go compete. And so I think that, you know, just like you said, it, being honest, building trust, you know, they're going to respect that versus circumventing it somehow and, and leaving them to wonder. Right. And yeah. And just, just being direct, being direct about everything. You know, I've had students, we have a little thing when they step off the mats, well, how did you do? And I want their feedback and I don't want to know if they got first, second or third. I don't want to know any of that crap. They all know that. And that's something when new people start competing with us, they have to kind of, because mom and dad always want to, oh, did they get first or second? I don't care. I want to know how you did. And there's been times where by, um, you know, Kendall, for example, she stepped off the mats and be like, how'd you do? She'd be like, eh. I'll be like, how many nights were you at practice last week? Yeah, yeah, I know. I was like, and this is what happens. And I'm very blunt with them. Hey, we didn't practice hard enough. Or did you turn, you know, maybe maybe there was a step in the form wrong. Be like, well, you need to do it another thousand times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's just being very honest that it comes with repetition. It comes with hard work. You know, I push all of them to read um, anything about Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan or any of them about the basics yeah. and how they practice the basics and that it's the guy that does everything. We have the Bruce Lee quote about, you know, don't fear the guy um, that does 10,000 kicks, but that did one kick 10,000 times. We have that huge on the wall in the school. Right. And I tell them that's the truth. Like it's about the repetition and being honest, like we'll walk off the mats and, and they'll even give me feedback. I'll be like, all right, how'd I look? And they'll be like, Oh, I'm like, yeah, I felt that. Yeah, I did there. Okay. But it's, it's from, a, and I tell them that, Hey, this is from a place. Of, I, I love you guys, but wow, that looked terrible. Yeah, I know. I'm like, you haven't been practicing. I can tell that honesty is what you need in a coach. You need, you need that. It's so, people in your life in general, everybody's so quick to want to tell you what you want to hear. And that's not a good thing. Yeah. 
And like you said, I think you you create the environment, you build that trust, it's received, right? And I think yes, it you, is. Very and I loved how you, you know, when they come off the mat, you know, it's not about the results. It's about how is the process for you out there, right? Yeah. And they're connecting it in Kindle's example back to, and maybe you may need to do a little more reps, uh, you know, step yep. it up a yep. little bit, right? And, and you're, you're, you're leading them to their own solutions and saying, hey, you sucked out there because you hadn't practiced as much. And when you were, your effort was lousy. Yeah. Like, okay, we're, they're going to be fired up to come back tomorrow. Pro probably a little less, you know, uh, some people respond differently, but um, I love how you focus it right to what's the process. Where are you at? Where's that connecting? Where can we connect that? Cause that's going to help you as a coach make the next mat appearance, hopefully a, a little bit better. Right. Oh, for sure. And that's always the goal. And, and there's days that I'm like, wow, that looked great. And they might not place. I'll be like, well, it was that person's day today. Today wasn't your day. You're going to have your day. And we will, you know, there'll be times where they come off emotional and we stand there. We have a, maybe a minute talk. And I'm like, all right, cool. What's your next division? <laughs> oh, I'm in that ring. Cool. I'll see you over there in a minute. And we're done. And we'll, it, we don't go anywhere else with it. It's not that, you know, later that night we're still whining or we stomp around. Like they may be emotional. They may step off the mats. And, and I mean, I've got kids that work really hard and they, you know, at, at Worlds last year, Kendall went to put her sword away and her sword case had turned and it stuck. And it probably cost her a gold medal because she was, I mean, on it. She looked good. She come over, she stood there, she cried her head on my shoulder for a second. And we were both, it was more of an anger cry for the fact that it just it shouldn't have happened. It was just a mistake. And we moved on. I said, all right, when's your next division? Let's go. I was like, use that. That you're okay, you messed up. I was like, now now you're dialed in when you get on the mats next. Now, now you're ready. Go make it up because you obviously aren't getting that medal. Let's go take it over here. Let's take this one. And it it works. And it's something that when people first start with me, you know, and it's different for each one of them. I'm totally different with all of them. Every sure. single one of them, I know how they respond and what they respond to. Um, and that's part of learning too when you're working with a coach, kind yeah. of learning what works for them. Big time. I think you, you nailed it. I think we, uh, a lot of guests and myself included came from some coaching generations of one size fits all do it this way or the highway. Yeah. Um, it, and like you said, you know, when you know your athletes, that that's the art of coaching. You can have your strategy and your, and your plans and all that. But when you know who the person is before they're a performer, that's when you can really start to drive an impact and work with mutual trust to, to do awesome things. Um, oh, for sure. You know, uh, resilience. It's the thing, you know, I coaches, especially young, young kids, coaches, how do I build resilience? Kid are, kids aren't as resilient as they used to be. And uh, what are ways to, I think reps, you know, it, it, like you mentioned earlier, is a lot of reps is what builds resilience. It doesn't take a few, um, but then we need help through some of those reps. But what are ways that uh, we can help young people and coaches can help kids build resilience? You know, again, back to being honest, putting them through the reps and explaining to them, too. It's something that we we discuss a lot because this was uh, something I had to kind of overcome in the last two years. Everybody. So when we run a martial arts form or a kata. Like you said earlier to golfer, his feet move. Well, he can do that. Some people can do things. Others can't. So some people are built different. Some people have really long legs. And so we have to adjust how they stand. So it doesn't affect them. So I may have 10 people doing the same form, but they all do it differently. And so it, teaching them that, that you can't, you can't get on YouTube and watch the top athlete be like, why am I not like that? Instead of asking yourself that question, be like, how did they get like that? Mm. You know, um, and to go back, I love Tim Grover. I'm just a Tim Grover nerd. Love it. Yeah, um, yeah. He talks about Kobe Bryant being in her practice and everything. And I, I never even paid attention to Kobe till two years ago. Whenever I found the book Relentless um, and then winning, I just dove really in hard. We actually did uh, Kobe Bryant quotes on a bunch of our uniforms and stuff. Sweet. Like I went, I went love hard it. into it. Everybody was laughing at me, but I teach them to, when you see someone do something really good, and I'm big with my kids on this because they're, they're 9 and 11, they're getting where they're on YouTube now, they see that stuff. Don't look at someone and be like, man, wish I was that good, or man, must be, must be nice. Yeah. Go, what are they doing that I'm not? You know, is that person 
putting in more hours than I am is maybe their diet tuned in better. Are they looking at it from a different perspective? Um, I'm big on bringing in different martial artists to do seminars or going to seminars because I learn so much from them. And I, I find a lot of people, I'm the only coach or I'm the only instructor in this dojo type attitude. And no, I've got friends that coach my students with me and that will be like, Hey man, can I talk to Emily after this? Yeah, please do. And they'll be like, Oh, I saw this. Like, Oh dang, I didn't even see that. Great. Thank you teaching them that it's, it's about them and about how good they do. So one of my students was having an issue with um, one of her forms. She's getting up back to Kendall again, up into a much higher level. And I told her, quit worrying about who you beat. Cause she'd be like, well, I got third place, but this one, this one, I normally, and I was like, you need to focus. There's a scene in the movie Ford versus Ferrari. And the guy driving talks about, he's looking for the perfect lap. And he's trying to run the GT40 in an absolutely flawless lap in and out of the corners of speed. And there's this whole like highlight scene of it. And I told her I was in, we were in Cardiff, Wales. It was like midnight. We'd all got back from training. She was really beating herself up. And I was like, that you're going for the perfect run. I said, whenever I step out there to compete, I want to step off the mat and go, dang, that felt good. I don't, but when I step off and I'm like, eh, I could have done better, but I still place. It bothers me. Cause then I'm like, ah, judges didn't see it. It doesn't matter to me because I'm like, ah, they did. I don't know, it, but it'll bug me. I go for that perfect run and I teach them that, that not to look at everybody on social media and look at everyone else around them, focus on what they do. Cause there, there are some kids we compete against that are homeschooled so they can just train all the time. Sure. Well, none of mine are, you know, that's going to definitely affect you. That's and good for them. That's amazing that they're able to balance that. Um, so you got to look at what you do. And I think in today's society, you know, and it's, it's always, it's something we've done every generation, but with social media now, it's so easy to be like, oh man, look at what they're doing. Cause everything's edited. Everything's trimmed. Everything's highlighted. It's not real. Yep. Yep. And teaching them that. Cause I feel like that's the biggest thing that hurts their brains as, as, as these youth are coming up is. They're just bombarded. I know myself in business, I'll see people I know putting up stuff with Ferraris and Lambos and all this. I'm like, oh man, what am I doing? Why don't I, you know? And I'll have to take a step back and think about it. Be like, okay, let's focus. That dude's probably putting in more hours than you. He started sooner. You know, he's working. You're you're behind the ball a little bit. Go back in his timeline a couple of years and you'll see. And it's like, oh yeah, they're right where I was. Yeah. You got to remember that. I think that teaches them the best. No doubt. It's a great lesson. Um, I know one of the things when I was a young kid doing Taekwondo, uh, I think it was probably the first time that I got visualization introduced to me, right? Mm. I mean, it was because I think breaking a board was one of the most empowering things for my little second, third grader self, whatever it was. But yeah, cause I started that first day as a white belt and it was like, well, I don't know if I can do that. And, you know, soon enough kind of doing that, um, but it was, yeah, see yourself doing it before you did it, right? See yourself through the board. Yes. And that's that real introduction. Uh, is there things that, ways you like to teach, maybe again, like it depends on the athlete, but, but ways you like to teach and cue uh, visualization to kind of prepare them and prepare the mind? You know, and we talk about that on two levels. So with the regular classes, we do board breaking and testing. It's always a simplistic break. And I, I explained to them, I always tease the kids class with, you know, in, Mar in Taekwondo, we hate trees. And they always get a giggle out of it. I'm like, no. And I explained to them about how a board is hard. And I knock on it, do the whole thing. It's hard. You can do hard things. And then we break the board and, and really try to push that visualization with them. That when something's hard, they can achieve it through this. And um, now as we get up, in the ranks, we discuss more of the visualization of visualizing yourself stepping on the mat. Visualize what it feels like. So before we went to Wales and then Canada, one of the exercises I would have the part, we were on Team USA, but the group from my school was going, we would visualize the podium. The first year it was a little hard because we hadn't been to a world yet and they're different, different countries host them differently. But the second year, it was much easier, but I had them visualize as because like, we would step up there, you hold up your flag, you drape the flag, you dial your head, they put the metal on us. And we practiced visualizing that. And I would even 
leading up to it, message them, hey, how's that world championship feel? And I would say different things to start creating that belief that they were already a world champion. And, and we would talk about it. And it was really funny because before the first qualifier um, for Cardiff, two, three, almost three years ago, Kendall and I were standing there and I was like, man, I'm tired. I said, I ran this form and got my medal and qualified like a million times in my sleep last night. She's like, me too. And I got to laugh and I'm like, really? She goes, yeah, I bowed in. I've got the medal. She goes, I've, I've seen it all a thousand times. She goes, I'm exhausted today. I was like, yeah, we might've taken that one a little too far. Cause we were both, my uh, wife was sitting there with her parents and they're like, you both look really tired. And then we started talking, we were giggling, but teaching them that like, for years when I was a kid, everybody, oh, Matt's a daydreamer, Matt's this, Matt talks a lot. But it, I realized as I became an adult, like it's manifesting. It's, it's visualizing the things I'm going to do and working it through in my head and my ADHD mind of, of breaking it all down. And I've, before I do something, I've already done it a thousand times in my head. And so trying to teach my students that like you can't just get up and punch and kick, you have to, you have to sit down and, and go through it in your mind as well. And it's yeah. a lot of people call that hokey pokey or whatever they want to call it. But man, I'll tell you it's uh it's real. Yeah. I mean, I'll up your hokey pokey one. Uh, another, uh, uh, one of our former guests uh, works with a lot of NBA basketball players. And when I, we had talked about visualization, she, you know, she talks about taking it even a step further using that brain. Like you said, the night before competition, a thousand times, maybe it is, that can be draining, <laughs> but, it was um, you know, it, in an off season in a training thing, um, you know, she would, you know, tell basketball players, you know, it's, it's easy to visualize yourself making a hundred shots, but can you just, let's push a thousand in your mind, you know, and, and use your imagination, you know, yes. and, you know, and when you create imagination that's bigger than self, then you just keep kind of stretching, stretching into that. And so it's even, uh, you know, I like to, like, it. I love when visualization starts to even start to press that imagination to, to the next oh, phase, sure. what's, what's bigger, what's beyond, how can I do that? How can I do more? Um, because it just stretches uh, our limits and you brought up one of my favorite things and you said that, that belief. And I guess one last question as we wrap up, uh, you I got a, a lot of great examples, um, but but how can we feed that belief? How can we build that belief in young people when they're trying to do things that so many coaches and kids are trying to do with high challenges out there? How can we build that in them? Start them by teaching them little challenges, little wins. Um, I spoke recently at a leadership camp uh, for our sheriff's department out here, and I talked to kids about their winning voice and learning that if you get up and you have a great morning, like get up, you have breakfast, you're feeling good. That's a win. You maybe you get to wear your favorite shoes. I'm kind of a shoe nerd. So like there's days if I throw on like a pair of shoes, I'm really digging makes my day better. It's a win. And, and I was breaking it down for him, but how like it in society, we get so hung up on, Oh, I didn't have my pen today for class. Oh, my day's ruined. Or, Oh, I did this instead of being like, I forgot my pen, but man, I got all my other stuff like teaching them that mindset of winning on the little wins. And this is something that I kind of, I started noticing a lot of speakers speak on it in the, the, the um, personal development space on your wins, but breaking it down on a different level for kids. I noticed it with my children. They've been in martial arts with me since they could crawl. They've been competing. Oh man, Ben's 11. He's been competing uh, eight and a half years. He didn't win for years and he's still not winning like golds all the time. He has tough divisions. But we never walk into anything. I started noticing this at school. They'd have a, a competition at school. Ben would start telling me about how he's winning. Or they, no matter what it was, a foot race, I'm going to win this. Because he was used to having all these little wins. We'd talk about it. We, my whole garage is, is painted black. It's got their trophies and their medals and everything. And I make sure they revel in all the cool stuff they've done at their age because they know they can win. And, and by teaching these kids that you can do the small wins, everybody... After I spoke the leadership thing, I had a young man come up to me. It's autistic. Great kid. I used to train him at my school. And he goes, okay, so you're telling me that I don't have to be on like a sports team and win a game to be a winner. Like if I just have a good day, that's a win. And I, I'll tell you, God sent that kid to say that at that moment because 
the kids were at camp. They were burned up from the sun. They were tired. They just want me to start talking. Like we kicked a punch. And then I talked and you could tell they were like, yeah, yeah, wrap it up. We've got, I think they had, um, they had like a scavenger hunt in the woods. They had something way cooler than me. And so I was kind of walking out. I'm like, wow, that kind of fell flat. I don't know if they got it. I was like, I might have tweaked that. And then he stopped me on the way out and he nailed it. And he goes, and you can tell like this relief over him because he's not athletic. He's overweight. He's, he's there. He, he has no coordination. I mean, great kid, but he probably can't, he probably struggles to put his shorts on to be honest. Like he's a good kid, but there's no coordination, no nothing there. No one to teach him. Grandma always brought him to class. And he was like, so I could just do something. And that's a win. And like this relief of, I don't have to go play baseball or football with the kids at school to be a winner. Yeah. Uh, it was really cool to see. I like, I stood there and I was like, Oh, thank you, buddy. Like, okay. I needed yeah. that today. That, that showed me and, and letting them understand that, that it's, Without the little ones, you can't have the big ones. If you try to take a kid and teach them to do something really great, like win a world championship, but they've never done anything, they've never won anything, or they've never tried it anything, right. they're they're going to look at you like you're crazy. Adults do it with me all the time. They're like, wait, you have multiple businesses and wait, hold on, you're in Canada coaching today and running the bit? Yeah. And they're just blown away. They're like, they can't wrap their head around that I do. And I'm like, that's what, that's what we do today. 